Hey, great. So um, everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, today we have the honor of welcoming uh, Nathan Lambert, a PhD student in the East Department here at UC Berkeley, who is working with Professor Christopher Feaster. And um, uh, today he will be giving a version of his uh, qualifying exam, if I'm not, uh, if I'm not wrong. Um, and uh, he's graciously agreed to have this talk recorded over Zoom, so we're recording um, right now. And um, I will share the link with uh, everyone after um, uh, the recording has been processed. Thank you, Nathan. Great. So, yeah, this is my work with a bunch of collaborators, and I'm going to be talking mostly about the model learning aspect and learning control for low-level control specifically. And I'll get right into it and introduce a bunch of different methods that we could use throughout and into future work. So the context that I started thinking about learning for control was with micro robots, where we can have these crazy robots that we don't really know the dynamics of. And what we're trying to do is learn some basic control law so that we can do simple tasks like learn to hover, learn to walk forward, learn to go in a straight line with a rocket or any of these things. So we have in our group a bunch of different robots that are kind of at the stage where we're developing platforms. We have the Ionocraft, which I'll focus a lot on, and then hopefully we can create methods that are transferable in method to other robots like a walking robot or another flying robot. So a lot of my work has been in the realm of a flying robot with four different motors and trying to do attitude control. So generally, when I arrived at this problem space, it's thinking about what can we actually do to control the Ionocraft. On the last slide, we saw that there's these wires and crazy rapid dynamics. So we did, we saw the option of classical control where we're trying to make state matrices like AX plus BU. And that's hard because we don't actually know the dynamics. And then we're going to have a controller that's not matched and we didn't know if that would work. And then an option that we have some confidence in, but still requires some dynamics knowledge is PID tuning, where we'll need to know how the actuators translate into the state variables, and then we can wrap a loop around that. And then the two other options that I became very interested in are model-free reinforcement learning and model-based reinforcement learning. And the idea is we can set these problems up without knowing any of the prior knowledge of the environment. So we can just say, well, let's get an algorithm that hopefully is sample efficient, and we can use it for different robots. And what I'll be focusing on for most of this talk is model-based reinforcement learning. So as a refresher, model-based reinforcement learning kind of has three steps to it. It has this flow of while it's still learning some task, while it's improving, an agent will act in an environment with an action at each time, and then the environment will give return or observe a state and return a reward. So a lot of times at each time step what we're working with is we have these tuples of states, next states, with actions and rewards. And what we're going to do is we're going to train specifically a dynamics model to fit the states and then leverage that dynamics model and control downstream. So I'll talk about a lot of different pieces of this framework in the talk and then eventually narrow in more on the dynamics model and what we can improve there. But this is essentially an iterative framework that we could use to complete a task with very little background knowledge of a robot. So I started with this. And we saw the Ionocraft as a challenging task. So we then took a step back and looked at something similar. And we started working with the, um, a crazy fly quadcopter. And we were wondering if we could use model-based reinforcement learning as a low-level controller on a crazy fly quad order. So this is just like a starting point and it should be, oh, can we do this? And then what would we need to improve to bring this to more challenging robots that, are even, that have an even higher cost per test? So you can do things with a, a crazy fly, like protect it with plastic rings. but you'll still break rotors and motors and stuff. And an Ionocraft or a walking micro robot is even worse in that regards. So kind of the motivation here to summarize is that there's not been many demonstrations of model-based RL on physical robots. There's been a lot of simulated tasks. There's been a lot of leveraging simulation and learning models and then bringing that control. And what we want to do is try a more challenging control problem at relatively low frequencies and see how much we can use these dynamics models. We know that there's a lot, trying to compare this to PID won't be successful because for well-studied platforms like a quad rotor, the PID is, works so well. But where the goal is that we can bring model-based RL to less studied platforms. Crazy, the quad rotor is just accessible so that we can do these experiments. And then in the future, we want to bring it to things like the Ionocraft that have a bunch of wires coming off the sides that'll change the dynamics substantially. So we can't just use the same model that we learned for a quadrotor. 
So how did we actually do this? Setting up the learning system, what we did is that we want, had a simple task that's just minimize the older Euler angles. So we formulated this as a cost, and then you can say that the reward is minus the cost of the state. And then we're just looking at a quadratic error for the Euler anglers, angles. And then this is just from the onboard state values. And then what we would do is we have worked with direct motor PWM voltages. So instead of having any onboard controller, which is very normal, we would just apply voltages to the motors. So like on the crazy fly, each, each action is in zero to 65,365. That's the PWM voltages that we get to choose from. And we're just applying for that for our action space. And then again, to reiterate, the internal controllers are off, and we use this neural network for prediction, where we would take a motor voltage and we would predict how the Euler angles would change, along with learning some of the learning the linear accelerations and rotational accelerations from the IMU. So the IMU on board is an MPU 9250, which is what we have been using for testing the ionic craft as well. So there's kind of that mirror between the experiments. And we have used sampling-based model predictive control, which I'll have the details of in a couple slides. So then what our dynamics model was, was pretty simple considering a lot of model-based RL papers and even more have come out doing similar things since then. What we would do is we have two hidden layers with 250 neurons, so it's a relatively shallow model. And then we would use what is called a probabilistic dynamics model. So essentially at training, you fit the predictions to a Gaussian function and that helps regularize the predictions a bit. And then one trick that we did to get this to work in experiment when we're running at lower frequencies is we append the history to the input of the model. This history of the model kind of takes into account for um, terms like motor spin up and motor spin down, where we would think that our, the movement of our robot would depend on past states and past actions as well. And we validated to show that the model prediction accuracy would be a little better when you do this trick to give the model a little bit more info about its environment. And then what we would do for control for control, we would do what we would call a random shooter model predictive control loop. So essentially there's a lot of ROS infrastructure that went into this and in creating the setup, but we would send a radio packet from the crazy fly to a base station that had a GPU on it. The GPU would sample a bunch of uh, motor voltages and then we would predict through the deep neural network 10 times and you'd get a big spread. You'd get a spread of where the states would evolve to over a time horizon given the actions. And then you would choose the action in this case in red, you would choose the action with the lowest cost or the highest reward. And then you would send the action back to the crazy fly. So there's a lot of infrastructure so that we could use a GPU. And that's definitely a limitation where we need so much computation, but for now it worked for us. And our results, we kind of were comparing whether or not we could do this at 25 and 50 Hertz. And we found that you could fly it um, both frequencies. There's just a lot of downstream effects between how you sample your data and how you train models. So what does this actually look like when you're flying? So you could see that there's initially it just like takes off barely and then crashes. And then over time, we got some basic hovering capabilities where just to remember, all we're doing is looking at the pitch and roll. So we don't have any mo motion capture. We don't have any estimates from a um, visual odometry for the X and Y position. So all that the robot knows is its orientation in space. And even those IMUs are subject to drift. So we can see here after about 10,000 points, or just a couple minutes of um, training data. I have this video again. After a couple of minutes of training data and collecting data at 50 Hertz, we achieved a low level control that was pretty stable for attitude. The future work would be taking this and reducing drift by getting some velocity estimates so we could just keep it in the middle of the room and not have to worry about hitting walls. And that would be an even stronger test on the ability to do low level control with model based RL. So then I took this and we wanted to know where are we at with trying to fly with the craft. So we'll see here, this is PID control. And there's also these really thick wires coming off from the robot. Oops, sorry. And ultimately, this is not using model-based model RL yet, but what we want to do is be able to collect data like this and be sample efficient and learn a model fast enough and learn an efficient controller that we can take it to our experimental test setup for this new robot from our group, which is a pretty stable platform where we can put an IMU on it and we can test it. It's made in the nanofabrication facilities here. 
and we're trying to control this. But there's a lot of limitations, so it's more difficult. There are the crazy fly interfaces nicely with ROS, so we could have the whole radio communication with no tethers, and then send the GP, have the GPU compute our ideal action. With the Autocraft, it's plugged into an Arduino, which talks to a computer, and two-way serial communication is really hard. So we're going to have to think about more advanced ways to do control here, and there'll be more of that later in the talk. But the idea is, could model-based RL work in this environment? where it's constrained by wires. The PID is in bang bang operation. So it's kind of going from zero to a max action and zero to a max action and sometime right in the middle. So the action space would be really sparsely covered. And then there's also less data. So this is even the cost per test is almost an order of magnitude more to a crazy fly. For a crazy fly, I can run it a hundred times with a few crashes and then eventually you start to see some weird things from the state data. But with an ion craft, if you get a minute of flight, that's a good robot. That's a, that's a win from assembly and testing. So we need to scale up uh, our ability to learn from less data and this is an even trickier environment. So what we start with, the starting comparison here, is kind of saying, can we learn a model? Even with some sparse data that we know might not have full coverage, can we learn a partial model for the Ionocraft? So let me explain this figure. So in this figure, what we have is in black, underneath the blue line, we have a sorted ground truth prediction. So the sorted ground truth prediction means when you're at a given state, you, you can see where you're going to go into the next state. So if you take um, the future state, minus the current state and look at one specific index, like you look at um, pitch in this case, you can get this is one delta step. So every labeled point we have from collecting data has a delta associated with it. And then our model is also predicting that delta. So the black is the true delta underneath and the blue is the noisy predictions from the neural network. So we can see our model is definitely not 100% perfect, which is to be expected with real data. But this model on the left was good enough to fly the crazy fly and accomplish that task. And with basic data from the Ionocraft, we have seen that we can train a model similarly. So there's reason to think that if we can keep a robot alive for the five minutes that we need for the crazy fly and collect diverse data on the Ionocraft, it would work. But in initial experiments, that's proved difficult. So essentially, in the Ionocraft, I would get like a quarter of the data. And it would it's like a starting point, but it would be you get the data and that breaks the robot. So we kind of need to think about more sample efficiency and ways to improve model-based RL in real robotics. So back to the framework. So kind of took a step back. I've been playing, I've been playing with the Ionocraft. We make progress. There's a lot of downstream effects where we learn how your cost function can be improved and how is your dynamics model improved. But ultimately it's we need more fundamental I want to make more fundamental improvements to model-based RL and hopefully that can be applied to more robots. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about the dynamics model and there's a lot of questions we could ask. So what we were doing is we're just taking a one-step prediction and then we compound a bunch of one-step predictions and hope it's accurate enough for, accurate enough for control. And we can, act, like, we can look at how we actually do the predictions now. So we take the next step is a neural network model plus the current state. And what we would normally do in model predictive control and some other model-based RL algorithms are working similarly now is they compound these predictions. So you quickly get these really long compounding lists of your neural network. And what a lot of different areas in deep learning have seen is when you apply neural networks to themselves repeatedly, you get this compounding error where the neural network has kind of these weird regions where it's not really sure and then the errors diverge. And then what this means is when we're doing predicted trajectories and our model predictive control, that could be suspect. So like, what is a better way to do the dynamics model? This is kind of a question that I've been asking myself and it ultimately depends a lot on the controller. But what, if we were to have an ideal model, it would be accurate in short-term predictions, it would be accurate in long-term predictions, it would kind of just stay in the regions of uncertainty and then we wouldn't need as many points to label it it would be easy to run, maybe even more efficient than a neural network, like a linear model, and it's easy to train. Because ultimately, neural networks, there's a lot of data manipulation that goes into it to make sure that everything is computationally smooth and that um, when you're using real data, you might have extra states that you can pull in and out of the equation, whether or not you think that they're helpful for the neural network at prediction time. So, okay, let's see. Let's think about 
where the origins of model learning for control came from. Like where, how did we get to this deep neural network just trying to learn from some state data? So what I would claim in model-based RL, the idea for our model came from system identification where we want to do a set of elicitation trajectories and then we would gain a complete model and then we would learn control. But in reinforcement learning, what's actually happening is a, real, a little different. So what happens in reinforcement learning is we observe a task specific subset of the data where we do a task and we get data. We do a task again, we keep getting data that's kind of overlaying on Gaussian distributions and we iteratively learn control. So in the same state space, you go from a diagram where you think you're getting everything in the world to you're really getting this distribution around the task which is really different for control. And what I think we can do is because we know that our model is specialized, we can probably, we can figure out better ways to do this dynamics model training. So again, thinking about what the dynamics model is for, right now all we're doing is predicting trajectories. What we wanna do is we wanna make a link to using that dynamics model for control. And what I've talked, what I have been working on with collaborators is this idea of an objective mismatch existing. So right now we kind of go around this exterior loop. We can go in a circle here. And what's happening is we work in them, we take an action in the environment, it gives us some states, we train a dynamics model, and then we take that dynamics model and create a controller. But there's no link between the reward and the dynamics model. And then we just pass the dynamics model back to a policy that might look at the reward again. And these are both separate optimization problems. And what we see is we did a dual optimization over similar parameters and that might not be optimal. So we're kind of optimizing this one. We want to get the highest reward, but what we're doing is we're training a model that is only looking at the likelihood of transitions. It has nothing to do with the reward. So we're trying to get a really accurate model in order to get really high reward. But we already know that our model is local from how we're collecting the data and it's not going to have perfect predictions from every experiment we've done we've seen that there's some error in our predictions and it's increasingly so when you like that when we're working with real data so we need to think about what the fact what this little break in the optimization loop will do to model based rl so there's a series of experiments that showed that ultimately we need to rethink how we're training these models and have some methods to hopefully do so so when we're training a neural network, what we're doing is we take a series of epochs and at each epoch, we're going to back propagate the errors through the model and update the parameters. And the general notion when you're training a dynamics model is that you're going to lower the log likelihood or lower the negative log likelihood, and that's going to give you a more accurate set of predictions. And what we would normally do is we would train until the validation error starts increasing and then we would stop. In this plot, for a carpool task, we have the training epoch up to a very high number. In practice, most training would stop here just because people have finite time. But we can see that the validation error keeps increasing through 500 epochs. But what we did at each epoch, we saved the model, and then we ran an episode on the cart pull task. And then eventually you get this decay and reward, which is saying your model is getting more specified to the data that is trained on to the state action pairs that it has, but the reward is decreasing. So really this heuristic of likelihood might not be the best. We want to see how that comes into effect. So really when we would want to stop training is when the reward is maximized, but we don't really have the luxury of trying our model every epoch that we um, train it. So we're going to need to be a little more intelligent with this. So then if we look at this plot here where we're looking at epoch versus reward, we can also just collect a lot of different models used in model-based RL um, trials and look at how the model likelihood shapes versus reward. So there's a lot going on in this slide, but ultimately what we did is we took a model-based RL algorithm called PETS, where they use a, they train a dynamics model, and then they use an MPC planner to um, execute control. And we have the carpool task atop and a half cheetah task below. So they're kind of two mirrored experiments with similar trends. They're just expressed differently. And what we did is we took three data sets. We took an expert for each task and the expert is a, um, a trial that is solved. So we would use soft actor critic to solve an environment. And we take that policy and we collect an expert data set. 
an on-policy data set is a aggregated data set in the model-based RL framework of PETS where you do a trial, you collect the data. You do a trial, you collect the data, and you learn. A grid data set is trying to be representative of the state space where we sampled from the state action space and then we evaluate on that data. So for all of these dots here, each dot represents a model that was collected in a real model-based RL trial. So we're collecting data and training a model and we store the model for later access. And then what we do is for each model, we evaluate on three different data sets. And what we do is we see, trying to see if different data sets are predicted better by each model. And then whether or not there's a correlation between prediction accuracy, which is likelihood, and reward of the trial that was using that model. The trial was using that model, all the control parameters are the same across these experiments. And what we would see here is we're really interested in the region of these plots where we're looking at a reasonably high likelihood and how the reward varies. And what we would see is there's a weak trend between model likelihood versus reward. And that weak trend kind of is a breakdown of an assumption that practitioners were using. So when I do model-based RL research, I think that if the log likelihood is better for a model that I'm tuning, I'm definitely gonna have a higher reward. But if these regions say is that once you get to a reasonably high likelihood, you could get a reward from pretty much anywhere in your reward space. Especially in this half cheetah plot in plot E, you can see that there is a bit of a trend, but if I had a log likelihood of two, I could sample an episode from here or here, and the distribution is pretty similar. So ultimately what this is saying is we don't have a great guarantee on when we are training a model that if it predicts our um, dynamics better, that we're gonna get a higher reward. So really what we want a model to do is a model that we wanna figure out a training heuristic where if a training heuristic is higher, we'll get higher reward. So what this can mean at control time. If we take two of the points on, this, on one of these graphs that have a similar likelihood but a different reward, what is a model predictive control planner gonna do with those models? So what we can see is, what we did here is we took a model and we ran an adversarial attack on the output layers to just fine tune the parameters and try to lower the reward at episode time or at a trial episode with a very similar model. So you can see these models have very similar log likelihoods. So that's an average weight of their prediction over the state space, but drastically different rewards. And what we can see is the model predictive control kind of just has these areas where the controller diverges a bit from a subtle change in the dynamics model, where the averaging of our data and the averaging of our likelihood when we're training kind of makes it seem like the models are the same, there's this visual downstream effect on control. So what we wanna do is kind of figure this out and how we can patch over it in um, model-based RL. So we propose two ways to mitigate this. One is computationally simpler, which is training models to predict trajectories. So what we do now, if you're training a, um, dyna a forward dynamics model with data, what we do is we have random mini batches where each mini batch is a transition from our data space. What we're proposing is instead of random batches, you do batches from the same trajectory so that when you back propagate, the model is encouraged to predict samples from the similar trajectory in a reasonable way. And then another way is to reweight re the dynamics data around a task of interest. So we go back to this little square ahead in the beginning where there's a start and the end. Instead of assuming our model should be global, we're just gonna focus on this trajectory. And I'm gonna go into both of these now. So training with batches from a trajectory is ultimately what we wanna do is flatten, we wanna flatten the relationship of log likelihood versus reward. So on the right, a right is a reproduction of the same plot I showed earlier, which is on policy data, which is data aggregated by the PETS algorithm on the half cheetah task. And we see this area where we don't have a clear trend of log likelihood versus reward. And then as a control, what I did, originally our batch size was 32. And as control, I know that averaging over more samples and we're back propagating a loss would um, potentially change the trend anyways. So this is a batch size equals 900, just with half cheetah, but still random samples. 
It's 900 because a half sheet of trial length is 1,000 samples, and then we have a test train split of 900, or of 0.9. So 0.9 times 1,000 gives us 900 training points. And then to see if we can get a better trend, the last plot is a batch of 900 again, it's a, but it's a trajectory batch of 900. So we plug in each batch is a trajectory from our training set. And what we've seen is you kind of get a flattening of these lines on each um, iteration. And a flatter line is easier to work with as a designer because that means that as you increase log likelihood, you're more likely to get a higher reward. So we've seen that just with a little tweak in how we're training our models, we can get a bit better correlation to downstream control performance. And the second method to do this is a little more involved. It involves reweighting with a, the loss function that you're using. So reweighting the probabilistic loss or reweighting mean squared error when you're training a dynamics model. And what we want to do is we want to weight samples that are close to an expert trajectory. And this kind of means that we're going to have some Gaussian-like surface along these, um, along this trajectory where we want to prioritize data that's really close to our expert trajectory and then kind of let items that are far away not influence the back propagation through our neural network. And what we have seen is, I'd like to focus on one a specific region of both of these plots. I've drawn a, drawn a red line about at 500 training points for each uh, model in the cart pull task. And we can see is, when we reweight here, there's this whole region of more sample efficient performance. There's definitely still numerical issues because there's a lot of randomization in training deep neural networks and we need to fine tune it, but we think that we can make better use of our data in solving a task. And this plot where we're seeing is essentially on the bottom is the data set size and on the top, on the left is the sampling bound. So it's a kind of saying how close of our data points and from bottom to top is increasing the epsilon of this plot in the top right. So it's kind of saying, as you go further up, we use points that are, um, we use points that are further from the expert trajectory. And you can see that some, there's some more interesting downstream trends, even when not having a reweighting model, model in this plot where we're looking at how close the data is and how many samples that you use. Because in the bottom right here, with a standard model training procedure that's been vetted a lot, if your data is too close to your expert trajectory, you actually lose performance. And that's because we're using a, um, we're using a sampling-based controller, and a sampling-based controller is bound to take random actions that you haven't included in your training set, so you need some robustness. So that when you're using data that's too close to the expert, you actually lose performance. So that's why you kind of need this Gaussian distribution around the expert trajectory. And a future direction for work is figuring out how to overcome this need for an expert trajectory and a new model-based RL algorithm that's hopefully more sample efficient. So that might be something like taking a set of your best episode so far and using that as what you reweight by, and then iteratively improving the model and the task, hopefully. Okay. Back to this question for what is a better dynamics model. For now, we've been talking about this dynamics model that's just predicting the next state from a parameterized function. And what we want to do now is I want to focus on trying to make something that has better long-term accuracy. Really thinking about well, the area I've been spending most of my time in control has been with the model predictive control and just sampling trajectories. So what's a better way to do this? What we do now is we take a trajectory and then we split it up into discrete steps and each one of those is the labeled data. And then another model that we've started considering is we're calling trajectory-based models, which instead of conditioning on the state and the action, we're conditioning on an initial state, a time index, and some control parameters. So in the experiments, we'll use the control parameters we're using our PID control. So hopefully this will lead to another way of doing um, low-level control generation. So the idea is, at each point, consider this initial state, we collect each arc for a time index, a time index one, one, two, three, four. And what we can see is, from each state, we get these time steps all the way to the end state. And by doing so, we kind of have this 
overlapping of predictions that favor the long-term behavior of the trajectory more. And it turns out that we actually get a number of labeled training points for our neural network proportional to t squared. So for every trajectory that you get, every time step in your trajectory, you're getting a drastically number of more points than we would for the standard one step look ahead predictions. Okay, actually one more point. Just wanna reiterate, I showed the compounding slide before with how the operations are done. So before when we have these one step models, what we would see if we look at um, like mean squared error of predictions over a time step, for the one step look aheads, what we will see is that this error will be reasonably good for a time and then diverge quickly to orders of magnitude of error. And the goal with the trajectory based models is to have some error early on that will accept as a, sorry, that will accept as a numerical artifact and then hopefully capture the long term behavior of the system. Because with long term behaviors, we could actually do more true receding horizon control than we are doing for the um, just feed forward model predictive control right now. So the key properties here are that we're collecting a lot of data points, which is great for supervised learning. We know that supervised learning is just bottlenecked by data, the number and variety of your data points. And we're gonna look for long-term prediction accuracy. And we're an interesting point is that we're conditioned on control parameters rather than actions. So what this means, for now we're looking at PID control. And I also am interested in trying to parameterize for other tasks, something like, um, LQR control or anything with a real finite number of parameters, we might be able to run another optimizer just tuning the parameters while looking at long-term predictions of our task, which would be really interesting for saying, if we collect a bunch of data from different control parameters from trajectories, can we then just actually do good offline tuning of trajectories with, by just reframing our neural network? So what we can see is we have these downstream effects. And I've drawn here, on the bottom, kind of the difference in what we would expect the error bounds to be and our um, prediction mechanism. So our error bounds in the trajectory prediction are gonna be proportional to what is called the epistemic uncertainty, which is details that we could model but don't have enough information to do now, which is kind of like a PID oscillation. So if you're gonna run a PID controller, there might be some PID oscillation as it converges to a task. And that's the kind of idea which will be really useful for a control designer is because we know there's gonna be some uncertainty based on our initial state and all of this. And actually being able to run a long-term prediction and running our control algorithms with that would be really helpful for many tasks. So we did, we're starting to baseline all of these deep model types where we've taken, where a deterministic model is working with mean squared error and an ensemble is essentially taking the some weighted average of each model's prediction. And then we have this probabilistic model where we're saying that the like a probability of state prime is from some normal distribution, which we can regularize this variance to kind of keep the predictions clustered together. And then we have this new type, which we're calling the trajectory model. So we can copy these first four existing models from existing code bases, and we're trying to compare their short and long-term predictions to the new models that we're proposing. So an example task is we use the Reacher 3D task in Mujoko, which we can apply a PID control to five motor joints to kind of predict how it'll move through space. And what we can see is for the long-term prediction models, we kind of are getting this expected behavior for the long-term predictions, where standard deterministic models are worse than their ensembles. And then, as I said, we have these probabilistic models, or sorry, let me actually say what was in here, got this messed up. So we have the one-step models here, which are the worst, which is just, And then we have an ensemble of those below, which performs better because ensembles are just increasing the model capacity and kind of having more cross-validation over your training set. And then we have the trajectory model and a trajectory ensemble best. So what you kind of see is that there's some initial uncertainty and then the trajectory model converges to be very accurate. And the long-term prediction in the one-step models is kind of just whatever the numerical prediction gods decide to give you. 
So what we can see is that with this initial result where we're just averaging over the joint angles, that these trajectory-based models can converge to like a thousand time steps. When we're running model predictive control with the, some of the uh, model-based RL algorithms that have been used a lot now, we're stopping our predictions within 50 steps because we know that our predictions won't make sense after that. So this is a really exciting initial route to try to generate a dynamics model that might be more useful for the type of control that we're doing now. And that's an important link. So what are some of the next things that I'm thinking about when trying to use model-based RL? Sorry, with what we've learned. So there's the eternal goal of learning to fly the ionic raft. And this is a slide showing a basic approach that is ongoing and we think is promising, where we use a different model optimizer called Bayesian optimization, which is a continuous Gaussian distribution. We're going to optimize over control parameters to generate PID parameters. And we think this could work if we can get somewhere between 20 to 30 flights, which is realistically the next thing that I'm going to try when I'm collecting data. We're obviously locked out right now, and we think this is promising. But another thing that I want to try while we're improving these dynamics models is to only rely on a few flights, so say something like three to five flights, and then we're going to create some deep model. This deep model is going to be a model for our dynamics, and then hopefully with improving our dynamics model and understanding how control relates to it, we can then run a similar Bayesian optimization approach on the dynamics model rather than the real robot, where then we can tune the PID parameters on the dynamics model, and then with only three to five flights of a robot, which is a very realistic number of flights for these hand-assembled robots, we could then spit out these PID parameters. There's a lot of little things that'll go into this, like what is your reward function, which I could talk about for a whole nother 10 minutes, and I have extra slides if people want to hear about that. And it's like, what, are the, what is the reward function? How long of trajectories do we simulate? How many trajectories do we simulate? And where do we start our simulations? So this is kind of the idea, is what we can see here is we've already logged some data. The black lines, the solid, are long trajectories from ionic craft experiments. But what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to simulate future trajectories conditioned on different controllers. So you could say like pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, pi 4. And similarly, we're going to try the same controllers from different locations. And what we want to do is for different controllers, we want to average over a bunch of simulated trajectories and then take the one that is correct. And obviously with the um, with computational, how much scaling has gone into being able to use GPUs and stuff, we can average over a ton more trajectories than we would in finite samples from experiment. So hopefully with leveraging improvements to dynamics models, we can really directly generate low-level controllers to these new robots. Then also when I'm thinking about what goes into these models, there's other things that I want to try in the context of micro-robots where we want to make a lot of micro-robots. And something like that is learning to fly together. So consider if you have a couple of these drones, and you can see that we know that the parameters are going to be really similar, but when we get them, we're going to have to measure them and understand that they're a little different out of the box. What if we could take these similar robots and try to create some generalization of our model and then learn together for control? So hopefully what I would want to think is if we share data conditioned on some basic properties, we might be able to learn faster in a model-based RL framework. So this just seems really practical. You get a new set of delivery robots and you want them to be able to share data about what they're carrying to learn their tasks faster. And the idea is it might need a tweak to the model type that we're using. And this is a theme of we want to have better models for or match our model to the controller that we're using. So what would this look like? This is the idea of model-based multi-agent RL, where we're sharing basic parameters with each other. And we do that by conditioning our dynamics model on the dynamics parameters when you're predicting the next state. But then the next question that I don't have answered and I'm open to advice for is what's the best way to have a policy here? Do we still want running model predictive control on each robot is gonna be really computationally expensive. So we need to work on ways to distill model predictive control into something more computationally efficient as you scale up the number of robots. So for example, the test setup we use for crazy flies, we can't run the same controller on four robots at once. We would need to either scale down the computation and get a weaker controller or rethink how we're doing control. So that's kind of where I want to, where I'm leaving it for now is the idea that 
we want to make a new model-based RL algorithm that's more ready for real robots. And we have to think about this trade-off between dynamics model and control. And I've put a lot of time into figuring out different ways we could parameterize the dynamics model and where we're potentially um, losing performance. And we need to take that into the control area and have this be a, or, and I need, I need to do this and have a more back and forth discussion with that and then try a lot of applications. So any questions? Uh, hi, Nathan. Sorry, uh, maybe I missed this uh, during your talk, but um, do, do you have references uh, to like, uh, you know, your papers or, or um, relevant papers where like we can- Yeah, I do. I kind of like tuned this knowing that it was going to be a more researchy talk, but I have slides that I would include in the actual calls that are just like relevant publications and then targets. Like, sure. I, like I have a straight list. I just don't need to, I was trying to, hoping to have this be like, 40 minutes and then people could ask questions and give advice. I would also yeah. say, I think I need to trim the things I have done and put more detail into the things that I haven't done and figure out how to write those as explicit problems. But yeah, I do have that slide if anyone is interested, it's this slide. And then things that I'm thinking about doing. Yeah, I just think that's uh, that that this is all really cool, and I I I might want to follow up on it um, in in the near future. So thank you. Great. This is very useful. Yeah, feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to talk about these things. A lot of these are ongoing. So everything after the crazy fly flying, we are still working on. Whether it's like understanding the dynamics model or changing, trying out new models for prediction and control. I'm doing. Slides that got omitted for time because we're shooting for 40 minutes are I've been doing a lot of simulated control with different, uh, with the free body dynamics, rigid body dynamics, and trying to comparing different reward functions that you could use for attitude control and how those translate to performance of different controllers. So I have a lot of code for that if anyone's interested in trying out some of the things that I've done as well. Yeah, and thanks, or Michael put a comment in the chat, which is um, talking to Professor Borelli or looking into more explicit control or explicit model predictive control as our dynamics models improve. And that's definitely something of interest. I took a class with him and I've been just putting off talking to him, so I should follow up. I'm just curious. I'm not familiar with the um, the IATO crack. I hadn't heard of that before. What's the? I mean, it looks super cool, but what's the like? Is that just a test bed for making super small flying robots, or is there like a particular application that you could use it for? So there's so the there's a lot behind this. So essentially, this was the PhD dissertation of Dan Drew, who's also in the room. But the idea is, it has no moving parts, and it's ultra lightweight. So it would be kind of like a silent drone that we could use. And then you can think of tons of applications if you have mass producible centimeter scale um, drones that could fly. It's pushing the limits of thin film batteries. So like you would have to figure out how to integrate research grade batteries with research grade power electronics to actually make it a, into a commercial grade thing. But the thrust mechanism could also be changed into something like a glider which is a discussion that we've had a little bit in our group before the lockdown. But it's right now it's like at the stage where it's a research platform and it'll take a couple more grad students worth of hardware work to make it a stable platform. It uses high voltage to break down the air and that creates an ion current. And that ion current that collides with molecules and there's a um, momentum transfer that generates thrust. I left out all of the physics intentionally, but I think I'm gonna I'm gonna at least have a couple slides back up for that. I don't think I have them in this deck. That that sounds super cool. <laughs> Thank Feel you. free to follow up and we have a lot of information on it. 
Yeah, Nathan, very, very cool stuff. I think it's worth putting a physics explanation in explicitly about the ionocraft to make okay. it clear why you think that your quad rotor work will translate. Um, I think I think there are obvious reasons why once they understand how the uh, thrust mechanism works in a little more detail. Yeah, I have. I guess I have some. I have the physics equations at a high level at the end, but I don't have the thrust mechanism in here. So like this is the free body dynamics. In the bottom, you can see it's like you no longer have a yaw mechanism because you don't have spinning rotors. And then your force is some nonlinear force proportional to a current and some design parameters. So each motor, each thruster is likely to be off by some percentage depending on assembly difference, et cetera, et cetera, which is hard to measure. And then also your um, inertial parameters will shift depending on fabrication where you put your IMU. So I have data that shows like your XY inertial parameters will shift by like 20% if you move an IMU five millimeters off axis type of stuff, which makes it really hard to design a controller offline and just apply it to a robot because each robot is going to be different by anywhere from like 20 to 40% on the inertial properties, which is what will really determine a PID response. By the way, um, I forgot to remind um, everyone at the beginning of the talk, but if you would like to ask a question sort of anonymously, then you know, feel free to like message me or message Andrea or the speaker privately or um, uh, something like that. And we can repeat, either repeat your question you know, out loud without mentioning your name or um, find some way to communicate it to the speaker without uh, explicitly uh, sort of bringing up your name. So that's also a method of asking questions if you're uncomfortable speaking out loud um, in the Zoom sort of uh, framework that we're in right now. <laughs> I have another question. Does the trajectory-based MPC approach have any implications for required computation if you wanted to put this on board the robot? So with the new models that we're predicting, I, I think the implication would be, this is a very early stage, but the implication would be you only have to do one or two um, predictions. So you would predict at like a set time horizon. So if I scroll back to some plots before, in order to generate a predicted trajectory, you would have to do a whole bunch of predictions, but now they're time indexed. So if we're just interested at specific times, we might do like, you might predict at t equals, the scale is wrong, but you might predict at t equals five and t equals 10 and have some like intermediate weighting and final weighting. So that would reduce, you could reduce your predictions by like 10 X while getting way longer in the future. I'm very interested in trying to distill it into PID control. I didn't, it's not currently expressed that much in this talk, but I don't think that model predictive control, at least sampling based model predictive control is a direction that model based RL will find a ton more success in because of the computation requirements. Like I have, I have a table that shows like the computation frequencies that you can get for different amounts of sampled actions and how much you predict forwards. And, Shifting even to a neural network policy like soft edge or critic, you can run it at a kilohertz on your computer, which means most robotic platforms are going to be able to handle, like can handle neural network control policies. Whereas MPC just has so much more underlying bandwidth that it's just hard to motivate when bringing it to new platforms because you have to bring a whole computer and a whole bunch of ROS code with you. So that's kind of something that I want to pinpoint a couple experiments to run. There's things that we have tried, but we need to um, do some more reading before we have any more reasons that we think that things we've tried that didn't work will work in the future. So like you can try to train a neural network as a supervised learning problem to fit model predictive control, but that ends up being the control downstream doesn't really match the original performance. Um, all right, it's uh, 10 a.m. And so uh, if uh, any of our participants have anything, uh, sort of any other responsibilities to get to, 
Um, we don't want to keep you here, but um, I think I'll hang around for another maybe uh, two to three minutes if, if the speaker is all right with that, um, uh, just to see if anyone has uh, any last minute questions or uh, anything to bring up. Yeah, I'm happy to hang out. By the way, Nathan, would you, would you mind sh sharing some um, version of the of these slides with us? Yeah, I'll send them. I'll upload them to a drive right now and send them. Cool. Thank you very much. I'll just stop sharing. Do you think that you could um, turn your your future work into concretely, you know, next steps in a in a series of projects? Do you think you have those that in your head right now? So I have some that are there, and I think I need to. Okay, so like some of them are the learning to fly together thing would be buy three crazy flies and do a similar experiment, which is much more concrete. And I think I sh that's probably a slide I should have, which is like, we have a setup for starting this. I also think you raised an interesting question in that context, which is what do you do for the control with that ensemble model? Like, do, are they all gonna be controlled off the same model then? Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. And you do it all on, do you need three different computers to run yeah, three different I mean, like The initial experiment would be I control one at a time and take the average. But ultimately, like a realistic scenario is that you're a company and you have 10 robots and you want them all running on their own. And that, that would, I think ultimately that kind of thing is like two papers in the future. One paper would be showing like what you can do by mo sharing multiple robots data and what, what you need to pass into the dynamics model so that's actually shareable. So there needs to be some context. And then similar, there's a simple next paper. So we're like writing up the paper on the trajectory based models and cleaning up plots. But the first paper is just showing that you can do these predictions. And then the next paper is figuring out how to use it for control. So I think I should set up a slide that's like experiments for control, which is like, can you, iterate on PID control in it type of thing. And I think these are the slides that need the most work over the next three weeks as I am making this into a like comprehensive qualifying talk. The Ionocraft is there and that's like when things reopen, there's experiments ready, which is annoying, but I need to have more concrete things like this is an experiment that needs to be run which i think adding a couple slides to the ones i proposed is a good place to start that well it seems like uh this is a good time to to end this <laughs> okay. um if, if there are no more questions of course um if anyone has any more questions feel free to bring it up right now if not then i'll wait maybe another 10 seconds or something and then I'll shut down the recording. Okay.